In this video, I want to open up a philosophical conversation with you guys. This is something we haven't done in a while, but it's something that's been on my mind for, I guess, the last six months. And namely, I want to talk about the technical side of photography versus the creative side of photography. And where is that balance? Where is that line drawn? And I think this is something that's fairly interesting because in the last six months, we have seen this marketing blitzkrieg from Japanese camera manufacturers, new models, more autofocus features, more megapixels, just all these incredible tools that we've never had before. And it what point is this a marketing thing versus what we actually need? And I think this is where we can open up some interesting conversation with this because I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but I think it's something worth exploring. And I've got a couple image examples that I want to share with you, and I'm going to start with this one. I suppose this is very appropriate to begin with because this is what is known to be the first photograph. This is a photo of a rooftop. It is an eight-hour long exposure that was made by Joseph Nesiphornieps in about 1826 or 1827. Now, it may be misnamed. Named. There is evidence that there were earlier photographs than this, but this is the oldest surviving example. So therefore, it is what we refer to as the first photograph, it is the longest fixed image, if you will. And I guess, you know, one way you could interpret this, and I've actually heard people do it, is you could go all oh, curatorial on this, and you could say, well, the, the amazing thing of this photo with the eight-hour exposure represents an interpretation of the tranquility and the peaceful lifestyle of 19th century Paris. I, you know, but that would be complete BS. This image is a technical icon only. It represents, now I'm not saying it's not important, it represents the beginning of photography and the lineage up to where we are now. And I think as a photographer, it's an image that I am fascinated with because of that. But there's really not an emotional or creative interpretation to this other than the fact that it is an image that was recorded. It had a technical component to it. It was very crude for its time. It had really not been done or perfected or really, I guess you could say standardized. Like you couldn't go to the store and buy film. You had to make everything yourself. So it was an experiment and it was one that worked and it's a really old surviving example and it's incredible. It is an icon and it's amazing, but it is a technical example. And so without that technology component of experimenting with chemistry, we wouldn't have that photograph. And I think you could make the same argument today is that I guess to some degree, we have to have some technology, otherwise we can't make an image. So there is some kind of baseline to what we're doing. Now, Photography over the years has grown, and I think this is where I want to show you another example, is that we are at a point today where we, I guess this is kind of a cliche thing to say, but I feel like in many ways, and I fall into this category too, is that we get really close to the forest. In fact, so close to the forest that we can't see the trees and we don't really understand or make sense of what it is that we have and how powerful that is. And I'll give you another example of this. This monograph of photographs by Martin Munkauchi. I've talked about Munkauchi in videos before. I did one a long time ago that was just on him. He was an incredible photographer and I think in many ways was a revolutionary example of somebody who influenced others. So maybe he wasn't as famous as a guy like Richard Avedon, but Avedon was hugely influenced by Munkauchi. So there's Mr. Munkauchi rocking a large format camera. That is what he photographed. No autofocus, no image stabilization. It used sheet film, it was big negatives, and that's what he photographed with. Now, by today's standards, we have very small portable cameras with very advanced autofocus. Like, for instance, Sony are making just some amazing strides in what you can do with autofocus and your quote-unquote hit rate with how successful you are with having images that are usable in the end. So one would think back in the 1920s that shooting sports would be next to impossible. Let me show you what Martin did. Now, there may be some cropping going on in these images, but there was no frame rate or anything. You took one image and then you had to flip the thing over to get to the next negative. And when you understand how these images were made, they are pretty impressive. Now, this is not normal for the 1920s, and I think that that speaks somewhat to Munkauchi's talent because he was a photographer who was very unusual. He had an enormous amount of talent, was able to take the tools that he had and be able to work with them. Another example, this is a hammer. It is designed to do, I guess, two things. You can drive nails with it, and you can also remove nails with it. But the hammer by itself is not going to build an amazing deck. It's not going to design a house. It is a tool very used for a very specific part of that bigger picture. And I think in many ways, the camera can be pretty much defined as that as well. But to bring this back to Martin Munkauchi, Munkauchi used the tools that were available of his time. And it wasn't the tools or the camera that made that work interesting. It was his abilities as a photographer, his ability to come in and interpret a situation and to create a photograph. And I think more importantly, his abilities to recognize the limitations of what the tool was allowing him to do and find ways to move beyond that. And that's what made Munkauchi very interesting. 
interesting as a photographer. Now, I also think it's important to contextualize what we're talking about because the world we live in today is very different than the world that Munkauchi lived in. And we have seen this explosion in the last 15 years in photography that have really changed things in a much more dramatic fashion than all of the years that led up to that. And we are in a situation now where we're not talking about the rock star photographer anymore who graces the cover of a fashion magazine and shows us these amazing images. We're not talking about museums or galleries. I mean, everything's changed. Photography is a lot more democratized than it used to be. A lot of that has to do with the fact that everybody's got a cell phone with a camera on it and that you're able to use that to get within a moment of something. And there's an intimacy there. It's not a big camera. It's a little more stealth. And I think that can be a really beautiful thing, actually. Sure, there's a lot of bad cell phone work that's been done, but there's also some really interesting things. And this whole notion of the snapshot and the the moment. And I think that that's what's really interesting about that. That started to change things. Also, I think there's a utilitarian layer to that. Um, you can use photography for practical purposes. Like, I will do it. I'm sure everyone else has too. When you're out of printer ink, you go take a picture of what model printer you have so you know what it is when you get there. It's easier than writing it down. So there's that. But this is a very different world that we live in now. And cell phones are one of three things that I think change that. The other two being the move to digital photography. And I'm not talking about the quality versus film. I'm talking about the immediacy and the fact that it's just so much faster. You don't have to have your images processed. There's no waiting time. It's instant. Uh, same holds true for the phone. And then I think the third thing that you see on the phone also is the internet and the fact that you can share things immediately. And think how this has impacted things like event photography, news photography, even sports photography. Where literally, you can have the game-winning play on the internet, on a news website, within literally seconds of it actually happening. And that is something that has changed everything. And the world we live in is just much different. We have social media now. We have, everyone kind of has a way to publish their work and even find an audience for that work. And for better or worse, that's where we are. Let me give you another example. There is a film that was made in the late 60s, you probably heard of, known as the Zupruder film, where Abraham Zupruder was an amateur filmmaker who had an 8mm camera and accidentally photographed the assassination of a U.S. president. This was a very significant film, not from an artistic standpoint, but from an evidence standpoint. But when you put that into context of today, I mean, minor news stories, everybody's got their phone out filming it. So this is something that's very commonplace now that wasn't so commonplace back then. So what are we doing now to push beyond the technical limitations? And that's, I guess the heart of this discussion that I want to talk about and maybe where that sits. So to put technology into the context of our world today, let me ask you a question. How many cameras have been announced or released in the last six months? I bet you'd have to count it. I would. I don't know offhand. Um, a lot. How many cameras will we see over the next 11 months through the remainder of this year? And I think that's actually kind of interesting because this is a really different place that we're in right now. And I'm not trying to belittle the technology that we're being shown because these cameras are, are just absolutely amazing. I was fortunate enough to be have been invited to the Sony event last week. I got to use the beta firmware for the A9 that will be in production release this summer. And I also got to use the A6400. And the autofocus that is available on those cameras is unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's like nothing you've ever used before on a camera. Now, the further question comes into play is, is it something you need as a photographer? And that question is going to be answered differently for you. It's going to be answered differently from me um, and everyone else. It depends on what your needs are. But my point is, is that we have tools that are available to us now that are unbelievably good and they are better than anything we've ever had. In fact, Martin Munkauchi wouldn't, I mean, they're, they're wilder than anything he could have dreamed of. But in that context of what he was able to do with ours, where are we pushing that envelope today? And that's what I'm curious about. And as many of you know, I mean, I love the history of photography. And for a long time, that's all I covered on this channel. I did a lot of videos on the history of photography. I'm not a historian, but it's something that I'm just really passionate about because I love photography. I love the lineage of what has led us up to this point. And it's just been on my mind a lot lately is like, where are we right now in the greater scheme of things? And, and where does our creative side come in to play with that? And I think that's really important. I want to give you one more example here and bear with me. This is a weird one, but this is a music example and it's one I've used before. But if you consider an instrument like the banjo, now this is an instrument that comes with a stigma. Usually you think of it as being used in bluegrass music or country music and or maybe early parlor music or African music. But anyway, my point is, 
is that it has kind of a limitation around it that's kind of mentally defined by people and the way it sounds, the way it looks, its name, so on and so forth. Well, in the late 80s, early 90s, along comes this banjo player named Bela Fleck who blows the doors off the joint. He comes in, he's playing rock, jazz, bluegrass, uh, bebop music. He's playing classical music. He's doing it all like no other banjo player that came before him. He pays homage to the people that came before him because he had an early bluegrass uh, association that he was with, but he took it much further than that. And that's what I see in Martin Munkauchi. And that's what I am wondering, where are we going to see that in the modern world of photography? And it's it's hard to say because like you wouldn't know what to Today looks like unless you're from the future but what are we doing today to at least try to shape that do we have a Bela Fleck that's taking one of these cameras with these amazing features and these things that we've never had before and using them not only to their full potential but figuring out how to move beyond that and I think that's where the creative side comes in or is this even possible I think it's an interesting question and this is where I want to hear from you guys because I think it's something that in the age of social media and the age of the masses and the democratization of photography is not addressed enough and it's not something we ask ourselves enough and of course all this depends on what you strive for as a photographer and where your interests and your goals and your ambitions lead to but I assume most of the people who watch this channel who comment have some kind of ambition and a place that they want to go with photography and I guess that's my question this is by no means ending in this video I think this is a conversation worth having more and more in the future but I want to know what you guys think drop me a comment below let me know what you think I'll see you guys in the next video until then later Thank you.